Good day everyone. Today I will be discussing about diabetes mellitus. What is diabetes mellitus? It is a metabolic disorder that is characterized by an increased blood sugar level due to a problem with insulin. That is the most basic and easy to understand definition of diabetes mellitus. Normally, when we eat a carbohydrate, your body will convert it into the form of sugar called glucose. Then it will go into the bloodstream. Since it cannot go alone into the cells, the pancreas, specifically the beta cells, will release insulin. Insulin is a hormone that will facilitate the glucose from your bloodstream to go inside your cells so that it can now be used for energy. That is the normal flow of glucose and insulin inside your body. So basically, what is happening to a patient with diabetes mellitus is that there is too much glucose in the bloodstream because the pancreas produces little or no insulin at all, or there is what we call insulin resistance. Glucose is greater than the number of insulin, therefore, not all the glucose will be able to enter the cell so that it can be used for energy. You will understand this better while discussing the different types of diabetes mellitus. Let's now proceed to types of diabetes mellitus. First, type 1 diabetes mellitus. It is an insulin-dependent diabetes and also called juvenile onset diabetes because it often begins during childhood. It is an autoimmune condition, which means your body attacks your pancreas, specifically the beta cells. This results to lack or no insulin at all. Since there is little or no insulin being produced by the beta cells in the pancreas, the glucose in your bloodstream will be high. It cannot enter the cells because there is not enough insulin to facilitate them to go inside. It is the most common form of diabetes in people who are under 20 years of age. Next, type 2 diabetes mellitus. It is a non-insulin dependent and also called adult onset diabetes. In this type, the beta cells in the pancreas produce insulin but the problem is either it is not enough or the body doesn't use it like it should be. This is what we call insulin resistance. It is when your cell don't respond to insulin and it usually happens in fat, liver, and muscle cells. Obesity often causes insulin resistance, so your pancreas has to work harder to make more insulin, but it is still not enough to keep your blood sugar levels where they should be. It is most common form of diabetes in people who are over 40 years of age, but can occur even in childhood if there are risk factors present. Third, Gestational diabetes mellitus. It happens when there is a high blood glucose level during pregnancy. As the hormones during pregnancy changes, it also affects the action of the insulin. Patients with GDM during pregnancy have an increased risk for them type 2, though the blood sugar level usually goes back to normal after giving birth. Insulin blocking hormones produced by the placenta cause this type of diabetes. The etiology of diabetes mellitus is still unknown, but these risk factors will increase the chance of having it. Type 1. First, we have the age. It is most common in people who are under 20 years of age. Next, family history. Having a parent or a sibling with diabetes will make a person at risk. Lastly, genetics. 
For the type 2, we have the age. The risk will increase as the person gets older and most common to occur at over 40 years of age. Next is the family history. Having a parent or a sibling with diabetes will make a person at risk. Next, obesity. This makes your cells in the body resistant to the effects of the insulin to the glucose. Sedentary lifestyle. The less active you are is the greater risk of having type 2 diabetes. Physical activity will facilitate the use of glucose as energy and it makes your cells more sensitive to insulin. Next is with history of gestational diabetes mellitus. Next, with high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and high triglycerides level. Smoking. Tobacco use can increase the blood sugar level and can also cause insulin resistance. The more cigarettes you smoke, the greater the risk of having diabetes mellitus. Lastly, alcohol intake. Too much alcohol intake can cause chronic inflammation of the pancreas, which can result to the impairment of insulin production by the beta cells. Risk factors for having gestational diabetes mellitus. First is overweight. A person who is overweight before they get pregnant or who gain too much weight during pregnancy. Age. A pregnancy over 25 years of age had gestational diabetes mellitus in the previous pregnancy, family history of DM type 2, and with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Let's now proceed to the signs and symptoms. The most common is the trypis, the polyphagia, polyuria, and polydipsia. First, we'll talk about polyphagia. Polyphagia means there is an increased hunger and the patient tends to eat more. This occurs because the food that we take that is being converted to glucose was not able to enter the cell due to a problem with insulin. So the glucose will stay in the bloodstream and cell starvation occurs. So the patient will feel that he or she needs to eat more which will result to accumulation of glucose in the blood. Next, polyuria. It means there is an increase or frequent urination. This happens when there is an increased glucose in the blood or hyperglycemia that results to osmotic diuresis. The glucose level is high that it was excreted in the urine. Then the glucose pulls out the fluid from the cells which result to increase glomerular filtration rate that causes increased urine output. Next is polydipsia. It means there is an increased thirst. Since there is an increased urine output, cellular dehydration occurs. Next is, due to the increased blood glucose level in the bloodstream, they tend to attach to hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a protein that can be found inside the red blood cells that carries oxygen to the body. So uncontrolled high glucose level in the blood or hyperglycemia will coat the hemoglobin that will result to slow or decrease release of oxygen to different parts of the body, which will now cause poor wound healing, especially on the lower extremities, numbness or tingling sensation in the hands or feet, and fatigue or tiredness. And then lastly, we have unexplained weight loss. Some common long-term complications will include retinopathy, once blurring of vision occurs to patients with diabetes mellitus, they should visit an ophthalmologist to prevent further problems that can lead to blindness. Next is nephropathy. Urine tests and blood pressure monitoring is very vital to prevent and slow the kidney disease, which can also lead to dialysis if left untreated and not monitored. Lastly, neuropathy. Numbness or tingling sensation in the hands or feet should be reported. Let's now proceed to diagnostic tests. First, we have random blood sugar tests. There is no special preparations needed, and the result will show greater or equal to 200 mg per DL and with symptoms of diabetes mellitus. 
Next is fasting blood sugar test. The patient needs to be under NPO for 8 hours. The result will show greater or equal to 126 milligrams per DL. Oral glucose tolerance test. It measures how the cells in your body absorbs the glucose after consuming a specific amount of sugar. The result will show greater or equal to 200 mg per dm. Lastly, we have the hemoglobin A1c or A1c or HbA1c or glycosylated hemoglobin test. These are all the same. It measures the amount of glucose attached to hemoglobin in the bloodstream. Hemoglobin is a protein that can be found inside the red blood cells that carries oxygen to the body. This test can measure the blood glucose level for the past 2 to 3 months. If there is too much glucose attached to the hemoglobin cells, the result will be higher. Usually, the result will show 6.5% or higher. Let's now proceed to different management. First, for type 1 diabetes mellitus. Since there is not enough or no insulin being produced by the beta cells, the management for type 1 is mainly insulin therapy. This is to facilitate the entry of glucose into the cells so that it can be used as energy. There are different types of insulin. First, we have the rapid acting insulin. The onset is within 10 to 15 minutes and its effect will last for 3 to 4 hours. Second, short-acting insulin. The onset is within 30 minutes and its effect will last for 6 to 8 hours. Third, intermediate-acting insulin. The onset is within 1 to 2 hours and its effect will last for 15 to 18 hours. Lastly, we have the long-acting insulin. The onset is within 6 to 8 hours and its effect will last for 24 to 30 hours. Then it should be followed by exercise. This is to help the reduction of glucose in the bloodstream by increasing its utilization. Lastly, careful meal plan. For the type 2, since there is not enough insulin being produced by the beta cells or there is insulin resistance, the management will be the following. First, exercise regularly. It increases the sensitivity of the receptor site, thus it will help with the problem of insulin resistance. It also increases the utilization of glucose if not enough insulin is being produced by the beta cells. Next is diet. Avoid simple carbohydrates and prefer to eat complex carbohydrates which are high in fiber. Avoid also saturated fats. You should maintain your blood cholesterol and triglyceride level at a normal range. Next is keep a healthy weight. Oral hypoglycemic agents. This is an oral medication used to lower the blood glucose level. Lastly, insulin therapy will also be needed if your blood glucose level is still high even if you are taking oral hypoglycemic agents together with diet and exercise. Next is management for gestational diabetes mellitus. The risk is more for the baby than the mother. So the mother should manage your blood glucose by careful meal plan with enough nutrients and less fat and calories. Control weight gain that should only be within the normal range during pregnancy. Daily exercise that is only recommended by the physician and taking the prescribed medication to control the blood glucose level. Okay, let's now proceed to our next slide, which is the nursing interventions. First, check the vital signs and assess for signs and symptoms of hyperglycemia. Check for three P's and patient's blood sugar level as ordered. Inform the physician if there is any significant findings with the blood glucose level result. Second, monitor the blood glucose level as ordered. Usually it is before meals, especially if the patient is starting to take OHA or insulin therapy. 
always notify the physician if there is any significant result. Since the patient is taking OHA or insulin therapy, always watch out for signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, like anxiety, slurring of speech, diaphoresis, tachycardia, tremors, dizziness, and headache. Number three, assess the temperature, color, sensation, and pulses of patient's lower extremity. This is to monitor the peripheral perfusion and neuropathy. Advice also to stop smoking or reduce, if possible, to reduce the vasoconstriction and to enhance the peripheral blood flow. Number four, maintain skin integrity by protecting the feet from breakdown. Apply skin moisturizers to prevent it from cracking and fissures. Number five, teach the patient how to monitor the blood glucose level at home. Number six, notify the physician if there is an increased blood pressure and give antihypertensive medication as ordered. Monitoring the patient's blood pressure and keeping it at a normal range will lessen the risk of having complications like coronary artery disease, stroke, retinopathy, and nephropathy. Number seven, Advise patient to check the level of blood glucose before and after strenuous exercise. Encourage the patient to eat a carbohydrate snack before doing any form of exercise to prevent hypoglycemia. Number eight, instruct the patient to take OHA medications and insulin as ordered by the physician. Inform the patient about the action and adverse effects of oral anti-diabetic medications. For the insulin administration, instruct the patient about the proper site and the importance of rotating the injection point within one anatomical site to prevent lipodystrophy and lipohypertrophy. Lastly, inform the patient about the importance of the prescribed diet and regular exercise. That's all for today. I hope you learn and understand something about diabetes mellitus. See you on our next video. Thank you for listening. I hope you learn and understand something. If you want more videos, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want nurse and to discuss something related in your nursing subjects, just feel free to leave a comment. See you on our next video. Thank you.